The moderator of this panel is uh, Vincent Fiorello, who made sure to tell me he's Italian, not Spanish, so I'll try to get the right <laughs> pronunciation there. He has really a lifetime of experience with regard to mortgage-backed <coughs> securities, mortgage origination, and so forth, and it's hard to think of a prominent institution where he has not been present. Uh, Merrill Lynch, Smith Barney, uh, Morgan Stanley. He is currently uh, at the uh, at double line. I, I think with that kind of background, we could say quadruple line and probably <laughs> still be an understatement. Uh, a great deal of experience there with asset-backed securities and commercial mortgage-backed securities, very much one of the topics uh, of the day. And this panel will uh, focus really on what's happening today. How does the mortgage plumbing work today? Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, hopefully we'll have everybody in in just a moment from their coffee break. But let me take two seconds to introduce the panel and how we're going to run this panel, and hopefully it'll be as uh, entertaining as the previous panel. <laughs> Josh is always entertaining. Anyway, Mark Palum is the Director of Economics from Fannie Mae, and he will be starting the program uh, Mark will go first after some introductions to discuss the housing market overall from an economic standpoint. And then secondly, we will have Tony Sanders, Anthony Sanders, the distinguished professor of real estate finance at George Mason University. And he will talk uh, primarily in about uh, some of the HAMP and HAR programs that are currently within the marketplace today. And then finally, we will close with Tomas Piskorski. And Tomas <coughs> is uh, Edward Gordon, Associate Professor of Real Estate at Columbia University. And uh, Tomas will discuss what's wrong with the current plumbing and what might be uh, fixable if we can fix this thing. Uh, I have my doubts, but uh, we will all uh, share our opinions. <laughs> so um, before we go forward, um, I guess we're on schedule. So Mark? floor is yours. Well, thank and you very much. If anything, please fill them in. No, it's all. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, just for, by a small way of introduction, I went to Fannie Mae in December of 2009, and prior to that, I spent 12 years doing economic consulting and started my career as a fixed income money manager. And uh, I'm very glad to be next to you since I got my PhD at George Mason. It looks like we're taking over slowly. So uh, just to help set the context, we thought the panel, when we discussed what we might talk about, that it might be helpful for the day if we discussed a little bit the overall macroeconomic context for the events and, and for what we're trying to achieve today. So uh, as we look at the economy, the singular most important thing for the housing market isn't necessarily in the housing market. It's the fact that GDP, real GDP, is now back to pre-recession levels but unemployment and employment, uh, particularly in the private sector, are not back to where they were. And by that I mean that we're still missing approximately 6 million private sector jobs. So that's still an enormous amount of jobs that haven't come back. And when you look at the unemployment rate, while the headline rate is down to 8%, uh, that number doesn't convey uh, the full problems we still have in the labor market. If you widen out to look at people who've given up looking for a job, those who are working part-time instead of full-time, the unemployment rate is really closer to 16%. And then when you look at the labor force participation rate and you compare it to prior recoveries, uh, this recession is much more like the 1981 in the sense of how we went in with a, a dramatic loss in employment. But then it's unlike all the other recoveries in that we've basically had very little expansion in the overall workforce. So you couple that with the type of GDP growth we've had and the type of personal income growth we have, and we have the consumer part of the economy basically having personal disposable income after taxes per capita being flat for the last year. So that really doesn't set us up well uh, in terms of trying to bring private capital back into the housing market. So we're very, very weak growth. We are fortunate to have some growth, unlike Europe. Um, and uh, you know, we'll be lucky if we continue to have two, two and a half percent growth because it's an economy where we're no longer creating growth by leverage, but we're trying to do it through productivity increases, which is a lot harder uh, than, than the way we grew in the previous decade. 
Moving on from the uh, labor market, what we're seeing currently in the housing market, when we look at uh, both, you know, since I'm an economist, I have to walk you through supply and demand, you know, quantity and price. But um, in terms of quantity, we're seeing the days on market is settling back down to something a little bit more normal in terms of the number of days, both in terms of condos and single family uh, houses. In terms of price, we're seeing some stability in the market for the last year, uh, and in ter both in terms of distressed and non-distressed sales. Uh, we, we, this first quarter, we've gotten um, firmer pricing on some of our REOs than we might have expected if you read through the commentary in our 10Q. Um, and so we're seeing some local stability in the housing market. Obviously, construction is still very weak. Uh, and, and financing is all coming basically mostly from the government. So uh, the housing market, while we, you know, we're glad to see that stability, we should be a little cautious about um, calling a bottom or calling the market healthy because that stability is currently built on extremely low interest rates. If you look at Federal Reserve policy, unprecedented uh, move into buying long-term securities and managing both the long end of the yield curve and the short end. And if you take a look at mortgage rates on a real basis, they're about two and, a, two, two and three quarters percent. In the 90s, which was a much uh, quieter period for the housing market, they were closer to four uh, percent. And so they, they're being very much depressed by the Federal Reserve. And secondly, as I mentioned, we've got uh, the government being the primary risk taker in terms of capital. So that's the context within which, uh, as a group today, we're trying to figure out how we can bring back more private capital into the housing market. It's not the best environment yet. Um, just a quick question. Um, at Double Line, we have an opinion that the housing market has not bottomed. In fact, we think that there's probably anywhere from 8 to 12 percent more nationally. Now, there are markets, obviously, within the country, Phoenix being one, L.A. being another, uh, Miami being yet another, where we've seen some appreciation. But, since, you know, from your purview, from where you sit, what is Fannie Mae's or your personal opinion of are we done, are we going to ride this bottom, or are, do we have some more downside? Sure, sure. And, you know, obviously this is a personal opinion and, and that of the economics group, but um, you know, we're projecting for prices to go down <coughs> another 1%, give or take, this year, and then uh, the following year to sort of stabilize. So that's kind of a flat kind of environment. There's a lot of regional differentiation. So, you know, housing was, the, the thing about housing traditionally was it's all local, right? It depends on your schools, <coughs> depends on your job growth, depends on the commute, and, you know, three miles away can actually be a completely different sub-market with different dynamics. Then we had a, an underwriting uh, price-driven boom uh, that sort of created a lot of national trends. And like you're saying, we're very much seeing the return of regional trends and really local trends. So we, I was talking to some people from for the Home Loan Board in Chicago, and they were saying some areas are getting multiple bids on houses. Other areas, still things aren't moving. Got it. Got it. Yeah, we've actually had that experience, uh, again, being in California. Uh, we have some young, some of the younger fellows in, in the office are trying to buy a house, and it's, it's amazing to me that there are, in fact, four, five, six bids, you know, above the offer uh, in certain areas. Yet you go down six blocks and it's, there's no offer. All right. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much for that. And, uh, Tony, if you're ready to go, we're going to talk about some of the programs and what you think is going on today. And let's see, uh, let's see if we can get some uh, audience participation after, after you're finished. Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to start off and say uh, Senator Corker stole all my uh, best <laughs> lines for today. And I agree with mostly with what he said. I like the idea of the uh, risk sharing. In fact, Fannie Mae with their multifamily delegated underwriting and servicing or DUST program has been doing this for eons and it was a great model. And I've always been surprised that we haven't adopted that earlier for, the, uh, for Fannie and Freddie. But having said that, I think that's a great model to go forward with. And uh, I also agree with what Senator Corker was saying um, that can we just let everything work itself out for a bit and stop tinkering with the market? Every time we do a shock to the market, the market takes a while to piece together what's going on and occasionally just freezes up while we're waiting. And we've made so many shocks to the market in recent years that it's very difficult 
to actually get a, a foothold in the market and let it recover. And by that I mean, in fact, we'll go back to something Josh said. Is Josh even in here? He took off. <laughs> well, anyway, jo <laughs> Josh Rosner made a good point. Um, he was talking about, we went back to 1995 with the National Home Ownership Strategy, which essentially is a very well-meaning intended bill to increase home ownership dramatically. It was a massive private-public partnership between HUD, Fannie, Freddie, and the banks, in which essentially it said, let's do a lot more low-down payment lending. Let's do what we'll call streamlined credit. I know when I saw the word streamlined credit what that meant. It means we're going to lighten up the credit rules. And then, of course, correspondingly, go ahead a couple of years, we get a big bubble. And again, I'm not going to attribute this to Fannie, Freddie, HUD, or the private sector. Put them all together. We just did this as a group. And then it's burst. And here we sit here today flailing around. So the first thing we have to do is eventually get rid of the massive oversubsidization of housing. We really subsidized it to the point where we had a heart attack. Low down payment loans, whether it's private or public. And one thing I want to disagree with uh, Josh about, I think was, or, and maybe even Terry, when we're talking about these alternative mortgage contracts, some, not, not the Alt-A, but when we're talking about some of the alternative mortgage contracts, such as uh, pay option arms, they have those overseas in Australia, and they, they've been perfectly fine. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that combined with, this was a vacation home, second home bubble. I think that's where we ran into real trouble. And then the Fed, of course, then tightened rates right at the time when we were most vulnerable, and we, you know, the rest is history. But let me just, just for one second, on the pay option arm issue, because we have never bought them, have always felt that they were dangerous as an investment. Uh, but I think the product was really aimed at well-heeled individuals, mm -hmm. okay? Someone who was managing for his tax bill, mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest. So was Io. So was the product bad or was the distribution to another level of borrower the, 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 the wrong? I, I think the product is actually perfectly fine. It was just got siphoned off to the wrong group of people. Okay, great. And th there, that's when we had the trouble. Okay. Now, where does that leave us? Well, starting in 2009, the Obama administration and Congress came out with the uh, Financial Stability Act, which created HAMP. And uh, we all know that HAMP, um, which I warned Treasury about in December of 2008, I gave a presentation of Treasury to several of the Republican members, including some of the transition team, and just said, this isn't going to work. For example, this problem is so severe that you just, so you're going to do what, what you'd expect government to do. They're going to do low-hanging fruit right off the bat, which they did. They picked off the easy ones. And then, but I said, once they're gone, this is going to be a very, very difficult problem. You're going to have to do principal reductions eventually, whether you like it or not. Um, and basically, the Treasury said, well, we're not going to do that. In fact, we're going to have to means test everything. And I went, okay, fair enough. But again, when you say means test, this means you're going to have to have borrowers, when you announce this, fax everything to the servicer en masse. And this is going to create a massive log jam. And the servicers aren't set up at this point. Okay, scroll ahead a few years. So we've already gone through this log jam. We now have 14 loan modification programs from the administration. 14. We also have... Um, the NOW program as well on top of that. And I'm still talking about, we're still thinking of two more iterations of loan modification programs. So we have HAMP and HARP. Um, again, perfectly reasonable. Pro I was against them from the beginning because I just knew a massive shock to the system will not end well. <coughs> but of course, they ignored me, and so we're, we're, we're sitting here with a completely messed up market. Has HAMP been successful? Well, it depends who you talk to. Uh, they were targeting, I think, what, 8 million people, right. and we've gotten 1.1 million. Yeah, if, yeah. if that. If that. If that. I'm just going by the Treasury and I got you. numbers. 1.1 million. <laughs> so it's not been very successful. Redefault rates have been higher than they were hoping. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, but this was a very difficult problem to give everyone their due, whether it's the servicers or HUD. 
is that we had a catastrophic drop in house prices followed by an unprecedented increase in unemployment, of which these people still aren't back to work. In fact, I think since June 2010, this is a horrible statistic, the good news is 2,000 people, or 2 million people, have left the unemployment rolls. At the same time, 2.1 million have gone on disability. So this is this kind of a very edgy employment recovery, which is not helpful. <coughs> it makes loan modifications very difficult. So, so then we have HARP on top of it, then HARP 2.0, which again, I understand the principle of it, letting people that have good credit, but they're way underwater, refinance their loans. Sounds good. Um, does it work? Here's the problem I have. The answer is we haven't had a long enough time period. We've put it into place, <coughs> it's starting to kick in, and according to Ed DeMarco, who I heard at the Brookings Institute, said he talks to lenders and it's really firing up. We're seeing a little of it in the Mortgage Bankers Association, the refi indices. You're starting to see refis pick up. Now again, that's a combination of <laughs> historically low mortgage rates and Fed intervention in Europe uh, melting down. But we have sort of, I wouldn't call it a perfect storm, but we have historically low rates. We have Europe is in a state of panic, causing money to get funneled over here in the treasury market, pushing treasury rates down. At one point, with 14 programs, now we're talking about HARP 2 plus, which again is letting HARP go even further. I know Alan is in here somewhere, Alan Boyce is in here, and I've seen their presentation. Again, it's, it's fiscal stimulus, that makes some sense. But I would let HARP just play out for a little while. But the one that worries me the most is the principal reductions that's being requested by the Obama administration. And I know I, I saw my uh, fellow debater over at the Brookings, there he is, hey Andrew, um, that we debated over there and uh, on principal reductions, are they a good idea? And I thought going to the Brookings Institution, which is a f an excellent think tank, I thought for sure I would be the, the Lone Ranger. It was DeMarco and I arguing why we should wait and just see how things play out. The Brookings Institution actually came out last week and said, they didn't agree with DeMarco or me per se, but they just said, principal reductions we think is a bad idea as government policy. If individual banks want to do it, God bless them. But as, as, a, as, a, as a massive scale uh, idea, it's not a good one. And here's why. E again, once again, every time we do these incremental shocks, the Clinton, Cuomo, um, National Homeownership Strategy, again, well intended, was a, the, one of the single largest changes in public policy in history. On top of that, what did we combine it with? They took away the capital gains tax on housing. Low down payment, streamlined credit, and no capital gains, that is a recipe for a housing bubble. And that's what we got. And so that was a huge shock. I don't think whoever at HUD was supposed to be doing the models, looking forward to see how this would play out. That's a tough one to predict, hence I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> I would have gone and done bits and pieces. This is because this is a large system, it's not probably not the greatest thing to do. So now we're doing the same thing with HAMP, HARP, et cetera. The administration really wants to go through and write down principle. We only know empirical evidence from one-off transactions from banks. We've seen banks do a couple of them, not a couple, but they've done some. There's a difference between Wells Fargo doing a few principle reductions and then declaring a policy where we're going to have the entire country under a new principle write down from Fannie and Freddie doing this. The unintended consequences are, well, they're unintended, so we can't really predict what they <laughs> are, but uh, I, I always use the analogy of Jurassic Park. I have no idea how this is going to turn out, but when you don't know how it's going to turn out, we might create dinosaurs that'll eat all the taxpayers. <laughs> it's probably best that we not do it. Or at least do what uh, DeMarco has been hinting at, a trial program, but on a very small basis. Um, and I don't know if he's actually doing that, but he, he can't say. But, you know, it's interesting. It, uh, 
Everything Old is New Again. It's an old Peter Allen song. Uh, back in 2009, there, were two, there was a meeting in Treasury uh, with about 35 or 40 major investors uh, with Seth Wheeler, who was at the time the face to Wall Street and the face to the investor community. And there were two or three proposals. And back then, Hope for Homeowners was the big program. And I can remember the CEO of a very large hedge fund slash uh, private inv equity firm say the following. Investors are willing to help homeowners who have a real problem. Let's take one loss, one time, and move the ball forward. Well, that was dismissed out of hand. The second, the second issue was my presentation, where we would have offered the following. Anyone who was in their home who that is their primary residence. Anyone who has made 12 payments, sound vaguely familiar? Mm -hmm. And anyone who is willing to roll their first and second together, also sound familiar? And is willing to sign a recourse note, we'll take your loan down to two and three quarters. Again, dismiss that of hand because of recourse. At which point I turned around and said, let me see if I've got this straight. We're going to take mortgages down 400 basis points to those who can pay them. Avoid the strategic defaulter issue because you've got to prove that you've got a job, you live in a house, and we're going to raise the money through the municipal bond market, not even with taxpayer money. And I got dismissed. Well, unfortunately, we are now paying for those dismissals because either one of those ideas probably would have stopped a lot of the housing problem. Mm -hmm. Please continue. Well, I agree. And Seth Wheeler and his group was the uh, group <coughs> I made the presentation to. Right. And, and was dismissed out of hand. But everything I wasn't was expecting yeah. that. But, <laughs> but I knew as soon as they did means testing, which again, again, I agree with it. You want to do that for to protect the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. But again, as soon as you do that, that's just going to create a Pandora's back, box of problems. Um, but if we scroll forward, the, my big problem with principal reduction is, again, the moral hazard risk. Once you put out a headline saying that Fannie and Freddie now have been unleashed to write down principal on your house to 100% LTV or 90%, because if you just only do it to 100, you've got a problem because then there's only 10% equity in the home. I can't imagine the phone calls and lines that are going to be formed out for everyone, particularly say we're going to go 90 days late. How many people do you think might go 90 days late if they can cut their house the amount they owe the lender from 400000 to 175000 I think, it, you know, again, this is, again, unintended consequences. It sounds good in theory. Right. And probably politically, uh, it sounds pretty good. But I think from, again, they can't, he, he can't say, but from Fannie and Freddie's viewpoint, I think the losses would be catastrophic. I mean, I, I can't say. If you, I know you can. You can read the testimony. <laughs> But again, haven't done so. there's something everyone should take a look at. It came out a few weeks ago. Reuters has a um, principal write-down calculator done by, and I can't remember his name because I keep mispronouncing it, but it's great. You can actually put in all the various proposals for principal write-downs for Fannie and Freddie, and it actually calculates using all the current NPV models, everything in place, what this will do. And if you put in what the Obama administration was hinting at, it would end up costing something like, I think he said, uh, $330 billion. So we have to be careful about this. So if you do a small amount, it wouldn't cost nearly that much. It would be a lot smaller. But the point is, but why do just do a small amount? It should, that would be kind of useless. So again, my issue is all the programs, again, sounded good in theory. They've not been particularly effective, not because HAMP was designed badly per se. Well, we can disagree about oh, no, that. I'm, I'm not saying per but, se. Okay. I'm just saying it would have worked even if it had been designed well with the housing prices collapsing, right. particularly out in the southwest in Florida, and combine that with the surging unemployment. It would have been difficult had uh, the most brilliant person on the planet designed it. The so fact that they didn't design it very well added to the complexity of the problems. So, so the, the, the subject of this panel pretty much is how does the plumbing work today? And I think what you're hearing is that it really isn't working very well. Okay, It's working for Freddie and Fannie, but uh, we have evidence of uh, institutional investors who have been uh, always historically uh, 
purchases of non-agency mortgage backs, uh, basically standing up and saying, in the current system, we won't buy anymore. We don't intend to ever buy anymore. And these are major institutions, bedrock institutions. But what I'd like to switch now is to Tomas and to talk about uh, some of the things that have gone wrong, some of the bad actors that we have in our business right now. And I think we're going to talk about servicers and sure. we're going to talk about what, what has been going on and what does this institutional investor that everybody talks about, who, by the way, as Senator Corker so eloquently said this morning, is his <coughs> 401k and your 401k, what, what, what are they facing today in this marketplace? Uh, thanks for giving me a floor. I'm happy to be here. Let me just uh, say, as coming from academia, I have a luxury of being independent. Uh, at Columbia Business School, we, don't, we really try to understand where the issues are. We have access to pretty incredible data. So I want to comment on some of these issues. So first of all, I completely agree with Tony that modification is challenging. And the issues of principal reductions and how to do them in incentive-compatible way is a real issue. We actually did a study on countrywide modification program. In October 2008, uh, as a part of the settlement with um, Attorney General, Countrywide agreed to modify loans following a very simple rule. Essentially, everybody who has a subprime loan and is 60-day delinquent could qualify for some help. And what we see in differential sense, there is a significant increase in defaults on by Countrywide borrowers, especially by borrowers who have a lot of availability on their credit cards and who have actually low combined loan-to-value ratios. So kind of a borrowers who suddenly they defaults go up are people who essentially would not expect to default in the very first place. So these issues are a real issue. We find about 20% increase in defaults immediately after announcement of such a program. So I, I'm completely with Tony that if administration steps up tomorrow and says, I'm going to modify every subprime loan that is 60 days past due, you, we might have an increase of defaults in the order of 20% and plus in the country. On the other hand, it's a fast program. It's a simple program. So it's an issue of waiting costs and benefits. So this is a real issue, and uh, that really comes from the asymmetric information problem. Majority of people who appear to be underwater continue making payments. So the problem is how to screen borrowers and decide to whom offer the help. And 60 days, you know, waiting until they become delinquents is exactly this problem that encourages strategic defaults. So, so I'm, 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 I'm with Tony totally that uh, these issues are real, are real. But I want to kind of bring a little back attention why administration in the very first place think about intervening in the market. If all loans will be owned by the banks, then the banks would solve one way or other this problem. This is day loans, they sit on their balance sheet, they will internalize all the costs and benefits of uh, uh, you know, modification, principal reduction. <coughs> if they screw up, they take a loss. Maybe borrower, unfortunately, takes a loss as well, but we would be really very happy to sit back and let the market work. I think the problem is we forget about it sometimes, and um, a previous panel has very nicely focused on origination standard on the fact that tremendous amount of mortgages has been issued with very low um, you know, income guarantees, with uh, very low down payments, uh, uh, huge debt to income ratios, and so on. But we forget that a, a lot of problems also come not only how these loans were originated, but how they are handled ex post, and especially how in this country we handle the millions of distressed mortgages. And in fact, when you look on the data, more than 50% of foreclosures has come from private label mortgage-backed securities that account only for 15% of the residential debt in the country. Of course, part of that is totally unsurprising. These are the notorious subprime out loans, uh, very risky borrowers, so unsurprisingly they default and become foreclosed at a much higher rate. But there is another reason why these loans are foreclosed, or generally why distress on these loans is potentially handled in an inefficient manner. The people who decide what to do with these loans, why they get in distress, are not the owners of these mortgages. We all know that when the mortgage is securitized, the critical decision what to do with it is done by the servicer. It's a hired gun that in principle is supposed to work on behalf of investors, who the services are, Bank of America, J JP Morgan of the world. They originated or underwritten significant billions or hundreds of billions of dollars of these securities, and they retain their servicing rights on the loans they don't own anymore. And when you see what they do with these loans, you have to ask yourself a question, what are the incentives? How they handle the decision? Do they really act on behalf of investors in maximizing the recovery and potentially helping borrowers stay in a home. I can tell you what the data says, which we looked at in, at, at Columbia. When you compare two identical loans, one sits on the bank balance sheet and another is securitized, the loan which, which is securitized have about 30% higher probability of entering into foreclosure. 
It's not often very quick for a closure, often it sits for months there, but I mean, I'm talking here about delinquent loans. So you see that banks are much more willing to push into foreclosure loans that are securitized as opposed to loans that they own. Fact number two, the loans that are securitized are about much less likely to resume making payments, in other words, cure. So not only banks push them more willingly into foreclosure, somehow these loans are also less likely to, to become performing again. And if you look, and there's some good research that came out from Treasury recently, if you look on uh, what banks are actually doing with loans in terms of modification tools, you see that modification rate on securitized loans is much, much lower than on comparable bankhead loans. So the bottom line is banks are servicing very differently loans in which they have economic interest as opposed to the loans that are securitized. That was the main kind of intellectual uh, reason for administration to try to get involved. This failure is in some sense of markets in sort of uh, providing a, a reasonable way of uh, handling this distress. Of course, one could say, okay, where are the investors in that? And Vincent is here and I'm sure he has perspective on that. You could say, well, if there is a money left on the table, if banks are really servicing loans on the, in, uh, on the you know, thinking about their own interest. And remember the pooling and servicing agreements are really um, often providing incentives to services to foreclose, to put loans into delinquency because they essentially make money on foreclosure, they are reimbursed for foreclosure cost, they can <coughs> make money in the, if the loan is delinquent. On the other hand, modification is costly, it costs an upfront investment, but the servicing fees the services have are so low that in some sense from the NPV of the servicer, it might not make sense to make modification or quick foreclosure, but it could save a lot of money to investors and potentially be also beneficial to borrowers. Of course, everybody could say, okay, if there's a money on the table, if services are handling these assets in an inefficient way, where are the investors? But we have to remember the mortgage-backed security market is very passive. These are mutual funds, pension funds. These are guys who are buying AAA. They're not expecting to go to shareholder meetings every quarter in any specific pool and voice these concerns. Moreover, they're heterogeneous and dispersed, and they don't know each other. I was myself at some point investor in mortgage-backed security. I have no idea who the other guys are buying the specific pool. Somebody can be from Norway, somebody can be from Japan, from Florida Pension Fund. Are we going to meet in a room and have a coffee and decide how we're going to work out our assets? <laughs> and who's going to contribute? So this is, this is extremely difficult problem. And I think there is a lot of uh, industry initiative, and I'm sure Vincent uh, can, can tell us more about it, that are really aimed at getting investors together and try to work out this rule. So I would say that was the more uh, kind of an intellectual background for administration saying there is a market failure, investors cannot quickly coordinate, let's try to subsidize some modification. So coming back to the hump, I agree that this program uh, was a failure relative to government expectation. Only about a million loans were modified. The, the, the target was about four million uh, loans at least. I've just completed a study with a colleague of mine, Amit Seru, and members of Council of Economic Advisors and Treasury. Exactly evaluate. We have access to the data. We can see what happens with every single loan in the country, what services are doing every month with every single residential loan, both bank, bank held loans, uh, securitized loans, and agency loans. What we did find out that, first of all, HAMP did increase the modification rate, but of course it failed significantly short of government expectation. W interesting thing we find out, and I, I, I I have issues with HAMP. I think it was designed in a very complicated manner. The administration changed rules multiple times. It was very confusing, very labor intensive to implement. But let me just tell you one fact we find out. Few servicers that control about 20% market and did modification already before HAMP did actually respond at a fairly high rate. They responded at a rate about 100% higher in terms of the new modification than big bank servicers. And it suggests that not only the and, and these big bank services are also the, the, the services that own a lot of securitized loans, and they also own a lot of second liens on the bank balance sheet, so they also have these conflicting incentives. Well, I'm supposed to service first mortgage on behalf of investors, why I'm actually on second on my bank balance sheet, so am I really, what do I really take with a priority of liens here? Maybe I'm just channeling money to the second at the expense of the first. Let me, let me just jump in right there, because one of the biggest problems with HAMP, if I may, $400 billion worth of second liens on four, four banks' balance sheets, most of which were almost worthless. In 2009, had the administration allowed second liens to be eradicated, probably J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citibank, and Bank of America would be out of business today because the equity would have been gone. And that's one of the basic problems, and that's why in what I call the St. Patrick's Day Massacre, 
of 2009, which was in a meeting at ASF with, again, the same group of 20 to 30 investors. Investors were almost at a point where they were willing to do a pro rata or a two to one write down of seconds to first. And basically, we were told, no, Treasury will not let that happen because we'll put too many banks out of business. Exactly. So unfortunately, that's the reality. And, 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 I, and I would love, I know that there are 100 investors who would love to have access to Treasury's data on the modification because I think one of them sitting in the front row here would absolutely love to get that data. So, so, so let, me, let me just uh, push on that. So the, the bottom line is that servicer that did do a lot of modification in the past, had employed a lot of staff, get good organization capital, did modify prior to HAMP and did actually respond on securitized loans. They didn't necessarily have incentive. Services were down a lot of second liens, but uh, on a lot of securitized loans. They didn't have organizational capital in place. And as Tony said, it was very difficult. First of all, it was difficult for them from the organizational point of view to process HAMP. They simply didn't have staff. Prior to the crisis, servicing was just cost centers, a Cou couple of computers wired together and an IT geek making sure the checks are flowing through. There was nobody who had experience in modifying residential debt. Absolutely. And that was, that was a huge problem. But in addition, not only they didn't have a right organizational capital, I'm talking about the biggest servicers in the country, they might also not have incentives to expand it because exactly that's $400 billion of second lien sitting <coughs> that are carried, I don't know, at 95 Absolutely. cents on a dollar. Right. And you know, modifying first might tell me to modifying second to zero if you really satisfy uh, you know, priority of liens and they, uh, they might, just not, might not be willing to do that. So let me just conclude with, I think what we learned from the crisis, not only origination standards matter, but how assets in distress are also serviced, exposed. So initial focus was, wow, how, how come we originated these crazy loans? How come the markets didn't price them correctly? Maybe we're over optimistic, maybe there was government. We will be arguing for that probably in the next 20 years. But what I think we learned as well, um, that the significant cost was not only created by you know, reckless lending, but reckless servicing and uh, inefficient servicing exposed. So let me come back to the private label security market. Currently, we know that out of every loan that's originated, of, out of 100 loans, probably more than 90 are guaranteed by government. Only very, very safe borrowers can get access to loans backed by the private uh, capital. We're still arguing in academia whether we really want to have mortgage-backed securities. There are, there are costs, there are benefits, but if you really want to bring the residential mortgage-backed security market um, uh, back in the US, you also want to potentially channel more risky loans there because one big advantage of MBS is allowing risk sharing, access to capital markets, and so on. But if we have risky lending in the future, and if we're done through the private label MBS, my opinion is we're not going to get this market going until these things are addressed. And in particular, investors need to have a certain mechanism in order to have more say in not only how the assets are originated in terms of transparency, but how they are serviced exposed. In particular, in the next housing downturn, they would want to have a certain mechanism in place that would allow them to, to simply say and have a more uh, impact on what happens with the assets. It is a very challenging problem because these investors want to be passive. Many of them are mutual funds, pension funds. I think we need a certain rewrite of rules. For example, having some independent trustees. By the way, trustees are supposed to be watchdog on behalf of investors. We very often very good bodies with underwriters, originators. And in addition, if you try to sue them, you, you might have to pay legal costs, which makes it very difficult for investors currently to say something. And they also have to have 25% ownership in a pool or more to be able to voice their concern. So I think the future should have some independent trustees to which passive investor could seize in some sense the uh, voting rights in these pools. They should know each other, who they are, and uh, there should be some very transparent, simple mechanisms to say, okay, in this pool, this are, I have majority in this pool as a trustee. This guy's voluntary sees it to me. They might actually own me. I'm independent from underwriters originators. I'll be acting on behalf, on behalf of investors. I'll be a true watchdog of the servicers. The second thing we need to think about are writing servicing contracts. Just to give you a simple example, many servicing contracts give servicer, I don't know, 20 basis points of outstanding balance. This is not pay for performance. You just pay them for servicing, no matter what happens with the loan. A simple mechanism maybe to align better incentive of servicer, given certain percentage in what they collect from the borrower. Then if foreclosure is better outcome and quick foreclosure results in more money collected, the servicer will be happy to push for that. If modification is better from the perspective of an investor, then for a closure in terms of bringing more money, servicer would be will, willing to do it because he has an equity stake in it. And actually borrower will be also happy because he could stay in the house and that would avoid this huge 
externalities and costs of foreclosure. Let, let's remember that about 30 to 40% of current home value is lost in foreclosure process. So these costs are really very uh, real. And the third thing is about a little bit special servicing. The problem generally with working with distress crisis are fairly infrequent. I mean, it's generally a good thing that they come every 20, 30 years. The problem is a lot of expertise is lost. Guys who were at LTCM time, they knew how to work out stuff, they all retired right now. And there is the, young, the young people were lived through the 15 years of boom and they have no idea what to do. So I think we need to have a certain industry that's easily scalable in a downturn. We need to have few specialized servicers who would essentially get most of the volume of distress in a normal times. There are one, two percent of loans that get in trouble, but if there are few of them and there's an easy transfer of loans to, to where they could maintain this organizational capital to do the workouts, and if crises arrive, they could easily scale up because they will know the human capital, they would know how to quickly train the labor force. Actually, crises for them will be fantastic news in terms of their business model. <laughs> this is what we want. And, and, uh, but uh, the, the servicers uh, of mortgage-backed security should have an easy mechanism with agreement of investor to transfer these loans. I, I I'll stop here and... Yeah. Could you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, but, but one thing, I, w I agree with everything you're saying. But one thing we have to be careful of is sort of the bigger picture is that ever since the late 90s, we've been bubbles. We had the dot-com bubble, which blew up. We, we then created a housing bubble, which blew up. We now have a treasury bubble. God help us if that blows up. And then we've got a rental bubble. Now, rents are going through the, the ceiling. We do have Fannie. I don't think Freddie's involved in a little bit. But we do have them funding multifamily properties. But we seem just to be moving bubbles around, mm -hmm. which isn't particularly helpful to the longevity of the economy. And I, I think that's the thing where subsidies have to be pared back. And I agree, all these things you're talking about really do need to be done. But I do have a question for you. I disagree with one sentence you said and one sentence only. What was the compelling reason for the government to step in and kind of tell the private market and the private label securities market what to do? So the compelling- Even if it's market failure, why do they have the authority to do so, that? So uh, the view is you, could, you can, actually we had, we had a plan in Congress in 2009 and uh, Ed Morrison and mm -hmm. Chris Mayer, Ed is a lawyer, so there's an issue of how the government can intervene in the functioning of the private contracts, mm -hmm. essentially. So we love private, we used to love private contracts in this country. <laughs> now it's not obvious the reps and warranty clauses and other things are really executable. But I would say the kind of an objective was as follows. It's a market failure in the sense that in 2004 or five, when we originated these securities, nobody really anticipated the crisis. We didn't wrote state contingencies in these contracts because everything was nice, prices were growing. Now exposed, you find yourself in a situation when people who control the assets are potentially doing them in a negative NPV way, handling them. And yes, you, if you are pure constitutionalist, you could say, look, it's a lesson. Let's not do nothing. Let's, <laughs> let's let the people fail. Let's lose a couple of hundred billion dollars. Next time we will think about it. And, and I agree with you that this is, this, is a, this is a good argument to consider. I'm with you on that. I'm saying given also that administration have maybe shorter term goals than the longer term goals, and given that there was a lot of distress and a lot of people were losing homes and investors couldn't intervene, and let's remember who the investors are. Right. Of course, some of them are hedge funds or pension funds. These are 401ks. These are the retirees. This is their money. So in some sense, we are acting in an in in interest of a common good, saying there is a market failure. And constitutionally speaking, there are certain clauses which allow you to rewrite private contracts if you can prove that is a benefit to everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I say, that, but I'm with you, uh, Tony, I'm with you totally, but it's, a, it's an open question whether it would have been better not to intervene. I think it was very hard not to intervene at that are point. You, are, are you satisfied with that answer? Uh, Josh and I were testifying in front of Barney Frank uh, not too long ago, where Barney Frank was suggesting we break all mortgage contracts and, and private label contracts. And I don't know who had a stroke first, whether it was Josh or myself, but we are saying, you know, and I hear what you're saying, but when you, once you open that door, wh where do you stop opening it? And that's the problem we have, again, as I said, the National Home Ownership Strategy, well intended, I hope, <laughs> and we, we, so we create this enormous bubble, and now we're going back to the same government that told us confidently this would be great for everybody, and it was, and it was disastrous. Now we're relying on them to say, oh, we'll rewrite contract, but trust us this time. 
Uh, that's well, don't even that's open that door, that's John. That's 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 because if we go there, we've already put four banks out of business based upon my conversations, you know, which they should have been out of business, although, you know, or, or should have been subsidized. And Jim is over there waving his head, going, no, no, you're not saying that, are you? Yes. <laughs> but we could, well, I'm going to have a question for you when you're speaking, so it'll, be, it'll come. But I think more, more importantly, uh, what I'd like to do right now is one thing that you did mention that I found interesting. I think you said that some of the smaller banks, n- not Chase, not Wells, et cetera, did, actually did some modifications. Absolutely. And they actually worked pretty well. Yes. Isn't that interesting? It was on their balance sheets? These are actually the banks that have, so that's my view on that. These are the banks that have significant share of bank held loans on their balance sheets. Okay. That give them incentive to invest in servicing even before any government okay. initiative. So okay. they have much more staff, much better employees. Okay. And when the HAMP came, they could scale back the expertise on securitized loans, which okay. the HAMP provided incentives for. Okay, yes. If I could jump in on that comment. Um, you know, I think one of the simple things we can take away from the, the crisis in this whole discussion is that if, when the credit owner controls the servicing contract, and um, it just works better. So what do you see happening with the agency model? Um, we control the servicing. It's been a learning process without a doubt. And when you get into the messy business of actually not doing public policy, work, but executing on the ground, dealing with services, dealing with people on the phone. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the program changes and things happen because facts and circumstances are always so different. Um, but I do think that when you see that happening in the bank portfolios, you see that with FHA and with the GSEs, it's because the incentives are better aligned. Correct. Uh, you know, unforeseen things happen right. and, mm-hmm. and then the incentives matter at that point. Mark, how much, how much has Fannie put back? Do you know? Uh, you may or may not know the number, and maybe you don't want to disclose, and I'm perfectly fine with that because I have a number in my mind, but I think it's a billion or, uh, you know, several billion dollars worth of loans, if not more. Several hundred billion, excuse me. You know, putbacks is part of what we're doing. Okay. A very important part is also, uh, we haven't mentioned short sales. It isn't just modification and foreclosures. Right. We've also found that short sales is, is, a, is one way to try and minimize, as you said, the dead weight loss, the other transaction costs, but at the same time deal with the uh, strategic defaulter in the sense that you have to be willing to sell and move out of your home. Um, and and that's, that's one filtering mechanism. Mm-hmm. So the, the, it, the crisis wasn't expected, and everyone's learning by doing. Uh, and you know, I never thought I'd go on a panel where I'd, where I'd defend a lot of the government programs. But um, you know, there was a lot of learning on the job for everybody involved. Nobody, the system wasn't built. If you went talk to servicers, whether it's credit unions, large banks, small banks, nobody had idle capacity sitting around for millions and millions of delinquent loans. Yeah, you know, and following up on, on Tomas' uh, point, uh, the last seven years of my Wall Street career was spent running the mortgage origination business at uh, Morgan Stanley. So they were all my clients. So Wells Fargo was my biggest client. Chase was my biggest client, or one of my biggest clients. And they do two things really well. They originate and they refinance. They don't modify. So to put this back on them was probably the biggest mistake to, to, to begin with. So, but what I'd like to do right now is open to questions. So are there? Yes. No one mentioned or, or raised the specter of should servicers have a fiduciary rather than just contractual obligation to investors, first. Second, shouldn't default have an actionable standard, not retrospective but ad hoc? And third, shouldn't servicer advances be disclosed and collateral shortfalls be reported as they occur? Wouldn't all three of these as requirements go a long way towards addressing the, the problems that you see. Tomas? So I, I, co- I think it's a, it's a very good set of ideas. I know one thing for a fact, uh, some investors, and we look on it ourselves, have a huge difficulty understanding there is a money flowing in a pool and there is a money being distributed and there is a significant difference between one and the other. 
I've heard about cases that the loans for which the investors are still charged servicing fees, but actually were foreclosed, REO and sold a year mm -hmm. ago. So there's a lack of transparency. And it comes back to the points that were on the previous panel. I think transparency here is a number one issue and strengthening the responsibility. I think independent trustee who will be like sitting on their back and will be completely in the independent from originators and underwriters and actually have a huge equity stake and legal power to legally go after them if they're really serious breaches of what they're supposed to do, I think that will be very, very beneficial. Je Ju uh, Josh, I don't know, as, insofar as fiduciary standard, I think that, that would, there would be major pushback from the banks on the services, primarily because, it, it, again, being a fiduciary what I, in what I do, there are the responsibilities are so uh, are so intense and so onerous and in many cases that I just think you'll you won't get it done. So is it a great idea? Sure. Will it happen? Uh, dollars to donuts, no. But you know something to, in the middle may be what we need and transparency most of all. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Yeah, first, um, um, you know, you, you, you rightly note the the failures of, of Ham. But I wonder, I mean, prior to, to March of 2009, the industry was terrible at modifying loans. People were getting modifications that were increasing, on average, their monthly payment. So I wonder what, what you think should have been done uh, to create a, or, or if anything, and, and if nothing, can you tell us why nothing would have been uh, preferable for the whole uh, you know, housing economy? Well, thanks for the question, Nick. Um, what I would say is, is that uh, supposing Chrysler built really lousy cars, does the government step in and start ordering Chrysler to build better cars? Other than the take, I'm a bailout takeover. But <laughs> having said that, prior to the bailout, they didn't go in and tell Jeep your transmissions are terrible, and then suddenly throw all the government resources at Chrysler to build a better car. So, Mike, getting back to your answer, is the answer is, is that, you know, perhaps we'll never have this experiment. Perhaps, although I agree with you, the mortgage modifications were not good back in March of 2009 for reasons we said. Unemployment went up, housing prices, and understaffed servicers. Maybe it would just have been better off had we just let the market go through the healing process faster. Instead, what we ended up with are just the Attorney General settlements. We ended up with all these things now have just stalled housing recovery. Absolutely. Pushed it out years. Oh, I forgot to get off the Attorney General settlement. But <laughs> do, you, do you want to talk about it? Well, <laughs> Nick's already heard my thing, so I don't want to bore him. But what I said was, <laughs> <laughs> he shook his head, no, he doesn't. <laughs> what I was saying was robo-signing, which was one, you know, this wasn't the only thing, but it was one of the biggest motivators for the Attorney General settlement. That is a, 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 is a crime? No. But <laughs> show me one person that was damaged by robo-signing, meaning that it was the banks and servicers and investors that were harmed by the borrower defaulting. All the people that were robo-signed had defaulted. All they were doing is buying an option to stay in their home even longer when they should have moved out. No, Nick doesn't even write anything well, down. Well, I've heard that Nick, 10, Nick may disagree before. with this, but I call it the sixth standard deviation of the problem. Okay. That's what it was. I will give you $100 for everybody over 100 loans that were actually robo-signed and that were current. I promise you I won't owe you any money, Nick. Now, do I think some people were taking advantage of it, robo-signing? Yes. Do I think that there has been lots of bad actors in this debacle that we face? Absolutely. But robo-signing was a great excuse to bring into the fray all of the attorney generals who then were able to plug state budgets with the dollars that, that they were going to get. Unfortunately, the $26 billion is really only $4 billion the last time I heard. And more importantly, <clears throat> we've incentivized the banks to take investors' loans. Now, I've had conversations with HUD. We had a very large conference call at AMI with HUD and, and with Secretary Donovan. And we've kind of come to an agreement We've kind of come to the understanding that it will be banks' loans first. What I'd like to know, and I'll throw this out to you, is when that attorney general settlement starts to happen and when those loans start to get uh, modified, 
will we in fact have the information which I would love to have this guy's information from the Treasury, but well, are we going to get the information that proves that investor loans are not harmed or at least only harmed to a reasonable or de minimis amount of 15%? If that's the way it's going to go down, we're good. Because remember, investors have always said the following. A borrower who has a problem, we're more than willing to help. A guy who borrowed $200,000 in 1999 <clears throat> then took out $200,000 on a home equity loan and then wants to be written down because his house is underwater, even though he's still working, I've got no bid for. Okay? And I don't think anybody in the investment community does. And that's the problem with principal reduction. Legitimate, uh, legitimate folks who've lost income, people who we really want to help because we want to help people, you know, there, there are ways to help those folks. But to get out there and to write down people's mortgages just because doesn't really f sit well with me. And maybe that's just because I'm an old guy. Well, I don't know. We forgot about the $1 billion that FHA got, which means they didn't have to go to Congress. Ah, yeah, so you're right. As part of the settlement. Wait until December 30th when we help our friend at the end out. But did I say that? No, I didn't. Well, Tomas, you actually have something in your paper with Chris Mayer pointing out about strategic default. Sure. That's saying that basically, if you if you offer the principal reduction, it yeah. So, so so I was I was mentioning it like a, a, we have a very nice case study because in October two thousand eight, uh, countrywide and B of A implemented a very simple modification program. Essentially, everybody in a certain type of loans with sixty day pass due on payments can in principle get a certain relief, including principal reductions. And we've really seen a sizable increase in defaults, precisely also in groups of borrowers because we have a, they access to the credit files. I see what, what they do with the credit cards, second loans, auto loans, how much uh, liquidity available they have. And you see that the most pronounced increase in defaults was among people who had a lot of available money on credit cards, so by no means liquidity constraints. And actually quite some of them had combined loan to value ratios less than 100. The program was LTV greater than 75. The big response among people have CLTV like 90, 95, so we're not even technically by our measures, and we have fairly detailed zip code price indices and so on underwater at that time. So this is a real consideration that, uh, you know, any national program would have the potential cost of bringing, you know, you try to help a few million people, you might end up with 30 million people in serious mm -hmm. delinquency, and that's, that's, that's a nightmare. That's, uh, that's not what we want. Are we out of, t one more question? Sure. One more question. In the back. Yes, Chris. Thank you for an excellent panel. Building on your discussion of recent public policy initiatives or intrusions into the capital markets by the government. I want to ask you, what is the new normal? Because when you speak to investors, they believe, they believe there was a social compact or an agreement with the government about the rules. And now we see heart plus things being proposed to change. You talk to Hill staff, some Hill staff said, well, investors are about risk. They assumed the risk that we were going to change things. So. I mean, have, is the market just nationalized? The bond market just nationalized? Are, are there no, is it just, there's no new normal? There's, everything's up for grabs? I mean, wh what should investors have as expectations going forward? Um, understand that the government will change the rule on you any day of the week. And within that context, <coughs> Do your homework, do your underwriting. I mean, you, you and I know each other well. I, I don't know how many of you folks know what, what I do, but basically I am an all-day uh, distressed buyer from time to time, as well as an agency buyer of mortgage-backed securities. Uh, our company is probably 75% mortgage-backed securities. Um, so we go in with eyes wide open. One of the things that we didn't invest in uh, were p uh, pay option arms because there's no history, there's no institutional memory to, 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 to tell me what's going to happen with that. Uh, the other thing we didn't do was not do anything on uh, non-hampable loans because lo and behold, and then this boxer coming out and say, hey, we're going to move the date back. Hey, you know what? That's a really bad idea. Don't move the date and don't rehamp anybody because now you've sent a signal to the Wall Street and to the marketplace that the TBA market is open and fair game. And the last thing to help individuals get into housing in this marketplace is to tell the, the street, TBA is now fair game. Do not do that. And really, 
if you don't rehamp, the number of, of borrowers, as, as per an RBS study, is only about 100 or 200,000 people anyway. So let us not try to help the, the, the marginal person and disrupt an entire market. So uh, does, that, uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, yeah, I want to follow up on your question is that uh, if you want to get the private label market back on its feet, trust. Trust so we don't go through what we just went through. And I, so I agree with a lot of the stuff Tomas said. But having said that, where are we sitting today? We're sitting here again with Fannie, Freddie, and HUD, FHA, have 90% plus market share. And I wrote a piece recently saying Japanese bluefin tuna has a higher rate of return than Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac mortgage-backed securities, <laughs> which says something about attracting investors in the future. You can invest in tuna and do better than we're getting with Freddie and Fannie. No, it's not a criticism of Freddie and Fannie, but we're just kind of boxes. Or the Federal Reserve. Or the Federal Reserve. <laughs> for, yeah, we're going to buy blue flint tuna in addition to right. all the mortgage-backed <laughs> securities. But, but again, trust has to come back with all the things we've right. suggested. And I think we are out of time. Am I correct? We are. We, this has been a terrific panel. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Gentlemen.